All right, how's everybody doing here this evening? Did you enjoy your extra hour of sleep? Okay, those are all the adults that don't have little kids anymore. Okay? Because if you know, like, like Carlos and I were talking about this, right? Like, daylight savings time is a myth if you have young kids. Because nothing about their sleep cycle has changed. They don't know what an extra hour of sleep looks like because they're waking up when they wake up anyways. I'm not bitter about it or anything. It's just the stage of life I'm in. <laughs> uh, well, I send, I send greetings from our sister church in Dallas. Uh, my wife and I got to be out at the North American Youth and Family Leaders Conference. It was fantastic. We had uh, leaders, volunteer leaders and paid, uh, paid leaders who work with uh, preteens, young teens, teens from all over North America, including we had a couple stragglers that made their way over the pond from Europe. Uh, but it was an incredible, incredible weekend, and we got to worship with our church together in Dallas, which our brothers and sisters, the Roberges, they send their greetings and their love to everybody. We got to see them. We got to see Hassan, the hoax, the hoax boy, was out there and stuff, so I got a little chance to talk with him for a little bit. Uh, but it was a great time being out there, but we are glad to be home. We are glad to be home, and we are officially in November. So that means it's 2019, basically. You notice that? Like when, when October hits, you basically just blink and it's already the year's over. Um, but you know, we've been, uh, over the last couple months, we've been going through a series, right? You see it behind me. For those of us that maybe are at church for the first time, we've been going through this series called What's Your Story? And the point of the series is that we, we've been wanting to look at interactions where people met Jesus for the first time and where he, Jesus got to know their story and their, and, their, and their stories that we were actually pretty familiar with but their encounter with Jesus transformed their story for the rest of their life. And really the connection that we're trying to make there is that, is that for those of us that are maybe trying to figure things out in our relationship with God, when we really do encounter Jesus, number one, he wants to know what your story is. Your story is valid. But also he wants to change your story to make it part of his story. And he wants to use our lives to change others as well. And it's been a phenomenal time. We've looked at a lot, of different, uh, a lot of different people in the Bible and the Gospels. We've had a lot of people come up to share their stories. I know Sean did a fantastic job last week sharing her story. Amen. And, uh, and this is going to be our last one before we, before we transition away from this and, and do some sermons to kind of get us ready for the holidays and, and get us focusing on gratitude. That's an important thing. Uh, but we're going to look at a man today that was a lost cause. And he was a lost cause that no one knew what to do with. And his meeting Jesus was, with Jesus was really intense. It was intense, intense and dramatically life-changing. The title of our sermon today, for those of you guys taking notes, is The Pigs, the Catacombs, and the Places You'll Go. Let's, uh, let's say a word of prayer here, and then we'll go ahead and just jump right in. Father, I do just want to thank you so much for this opportunity to be together with my brothers and sisters and, and just really to, uh, to be able to worship you in such a special way like this. Father, I know we take this for granted so often. I know I've been reading a lot about what's going on in Yemen and we've heard stories even from our own brothers and sisters that are over there and the situations that they're in that it's so easy to take for granted the fact that we can meet like this uh, on a weekly basis. But I just pray right now that you just soften our hearts Prepare us for your word. Please move me out of the way. Holy Spirit, just speak through me. And I pray, God, that you'll just really uh, uh, bless the rest of our time here as we engage with you in the scriptures. We love you in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, open your Bibles with me to Mark chapter 5. All right, and we're just going to kind of walk through this story together. I know I've, I've, I've done a lot of them over the last couple months, but this is another pointless sermon. I know, I know. Um, let's pick up in verse 1. I'm not even going to say anything about it. It's just, it is what it is. All right. Starting in verse 1, it says, They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him, 
And night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. I want to stop there for a second. Um, this is a pretty intense introduction into this guy, right? Um, which says that Jesus, Jesus arrives in this region. He gets out of a boat, and this guy is waiting for him. And the description of this guy is rough, to say the least. He's wild. He's unruly. He's unkempt. And beyond anything that anybody even knew how to deal with. He's so freakishly strong. that it, I mean, just the, like, I don't know what you were picturing in your head, but he's so freakishly strong that irons couldn't hold him anymore. Irons, like literal, like we're not talking about little handcuffs. We're talking about straight iron couldn't hold him anymore. And it says that no one was strong enough to subdue him. And actually the Luke account of this story says, says that uh, it had been a while, it had been years since he had been in a home or worn clothes. This guy was just this, this beast man thing. And it says that, that really... You know, that it says nobody could subdue him, subdue him, but you imagine if he hadn't worn clothes in a while and he'd been living out in the tombs, nobody probably wanted to subdue him. But it says that he was so tormented by the stuff going on in his life, by the, by the spirits that were, that were attacking him. It says he would cry out day and night and cut himself with stones, with rocks. The picture I have in my head, it would, it would be like if you combined the Hulk and Gollum and like had a baby, basically. Like this is kind of this, this cave-dwelling creature that is so freakishly strong that nothing can hold him anymore. This guy was so out of control and beyond help that he had just basically been banished to live among tombs. Something like this. And, I, and as I was studying this out and, and preparing for this this weekend, I was, I was imagining what the progression of this guy's life and affliction might have been like. Where maybe, maybe first it was his loved ones that just when they saw him going down a road, they tried to reach out to him, they tried to help him, but then they realized they couldn't. This guy was beyond their help. So they brought, maybe they brought other people in. They started, they started saying, okay, family, friends, can you guys help us? Like, like our, our son is just going a little out of control here. And then they realized they couldn't help him. So the next step naturally was like, okay, we're gonna, let's just institutionalize him. Let's send him to jail to, to load him up in irons, hand and foot, because this guy is such a danger to himself and such a threat to the people around him. We have nothing else to do, just, just lock him up. And then they realized that not even that would get it done. It says he tore the, the irons loose. So literally at the end of all this, I think, I think just the, the rest of the town, just anybody else was just like, we don't even know what to do with this guy. So just, you just got to get out of here. So there he was, home sweet home, for several years. The Bible doesn't even tell us how long. It just said years. This guy was living naked in a graveyard. Making his home among dead people. That's all that was left for this guy. To be a tortured soul beyond anybody's help. Living in a tomb. And I'm sure just night and day hoping to die. And depending on how life has hit you, we can feel this way. A lost cause is not worth saving. I've tried and tried to change. I hate my life the way that it is, but there's just, there's just no hope for me. I've experienced feelings like this at different times in my life. There were times in high school and college where I was so inundated with my addiction to pornography, um, I was becoming a perpetual and habitual liar. I kept trying, and, and, and I kept trying to become this version of myself that I thought everybody wanted me to be. This version that I thought would, would please my parents, this version of 
what people at church wanted me to be, this version of what I wanted to be with my friends at school. That I just, I kind of, my, my identity, myself just kind of got lost in all of it. Where I didn't even know that I knew who I was anymore. And I felt trapped. I felt so hopeless, so dirty. So unworthy of love that there were times when I thought about suicide. And there were times, sadly to admit, that it happened while I was sitting in church. I felt so dead inside, so ashamed that I just, I just wanted it all to end. And then the, the self-condemned preacher's kid in me had the thought a couple times... But what would people think if the minister's son killed himself? How would that make my parents look? So I've been in places, and I don't know what this guy was going through, but I've been in places where you just just feel like you're you're beyond help. There's nothing left. And you might be in a similar place today. But luckily for this guy, And for us, Jesus specializes in lost causes. Let's continue to read this story. It says, when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. I'm going to stop there for a moment. So this guy sees Jesus at a distance. He he runs up to him and falls on his knees in front of him. You imagine for a moment what the disciples were thinking. Here's this naked, crazy guy with chains bloodied up. All this stuff comes charging full speed on the shoreline to Jesus. But what I love about this is that Jesus doesn't freak out. He doesn't run away. He doesn't panic. He doesn't say, get out of here. He walks right over to the guy and confronts him in the state that he's in. And what's interesting about this interaction when he meets Jesus here is that he doesn't just automatically get better. And when he comes up to Jesus, it's not like the presence of Jesus just fixed it all. And he, just, he was just like, wow, that's all I needed, Jesus. Thank you so much for showing up. Matter of fact, it says that Jesus' presence brings his demon to the surface. And there's something really important for us to see in this. Because this kind of story actually happened a couple different times in the Gospels. In John 14, you know, the Bible tells us as Jesus is getting ready to, to go to the cross... He says, he's telling his disciples, look, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. When this presence, when, when the truth, when, when, when the life, when, when the truth of Jesus comes face to face with our darkness, it can be a painful first date. When Jesus encountered the boy who was possessed by a demon later on in Mark chapter 9, something interesting happens here. It says in Mark 9, 20, it says, When the Spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. So the presence of Jesus, you imagine like walking into church for the first time, it wasn't like all of a sudden just everything felt better. Matter of fact, it got a lot worse. The moment that this Spirit locked eyes with Jesus, the boy starts throwing around, thrashing, foaming at the mouth. This, This must have been a crazy, crazy sight. And it's similar to what happens with this guy here. That when he sees Jesus for the first time, all of a sudden these demons just start calling out to him. When we've been living with demons and darkness for a long time, being near Jesus, being near the truth, tends to draw all this stuff to the surface. And sometimes it even brings out the worst in us. 
And sometimes I know we, we can hope if you've been in a place of darkness for a while and you know, okay, man, I just got to get to church. But then you get to church and you start realizing, man, this is bringing up all of these things, all these feelings, all of my past, all of, all of this stuff that I've been running from. The face of Jesus just brings it out. When I started studying the Bible, I hit an interesting place. And, and there was a lot that I had to work with. I studied the Bible for about a year and a half because there was a lot of just stuff that I had to deal with. But towards the end of me studying the Bible, I was getting close to a place where I was, I was getting ready to make Jesus Lord of my life, getting ready to get baptized, thinking about the rest of my life walking with Jesus. We were studying the Bible one time, and I got really, I remember it like it was yesterday. I got really fixated. I was trying to prove my point about something. Don't remember what it was, but I became fixated on, on showing the scripture of the sign above Jesus' head when he's hanging on the cross, okay? And at the time, I didn't totally understand the way the Gospels worked and that there were four different writings and the four different perspectives. And so I'm tearing through this book. I was just in, in this silent rage for like 10 minutes trying to find this scripture. And I was so prideful. I was so embarrassed that I, that I, that I, like by how I looked as a fool. I mean, I remember I just started crying in anger. It was the weirdest thing. Nothing like this has really happened since that I can think of. At least I, I hope not. <laughs> but, but I remember I'm just sitting there and I'm just so mad. I felt so embarrassed. So like, just like, what is wrong with you? Why can't, like... And I remember the, the guy that was studying the Bible with me just stopped. And he, he, said, he said, you know what? You've got to be one of the most prideful people I have ever met in my life. And if you don't figure this out, you're never going to make it to Jesus. And it was this bizarre revelation type moment. Where somebody... As somebody that had been around the Bible my whole life, it was like all of a sudden God just kind of surfaced this demon of pride and arrogance in me in that moment in a way that I'd never seen it before. And the truth is, if you really encounter Jesus in the reality of the Bible, it's going to make you have to face the truth of you. You'll have to look at things in your life that are ugly and painful to see. And also the other truth of this is if you haven't experienced something like this yet, you've probably been playing church and you've not really met Jesus. Because Jesus has the ability, when you read about him in the scriptures, when you, when you have an encounter with a godly person, he has the ability of just, just staring your demons right in the face and calling it by name. And if you don't want it, you can sit and, and, and pretend like everything's okay. But Jesus wasn't done yet. Picking up in verse 10. It says, My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on a nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs. Allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told them about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. We'll stop there. So again, Jesus doesn't back down from this guy. You know, I, 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 don't, I don't know what it might have sounded like for this guy to talk, but I imagine if he's got a legion of demons in him, it would have been a pretty creepy choir of voices going on there. But he confronts the demon by name. And then there's this really weird interaction that didn't happen very often. Most of the time when Jesus confronted somebody that was possessed by a demon, he just called it out. The demon leaves. But at this point, the demon has a conversation with Jesus. It doesn't just go quietly. 
where they asked they ask not to leave the area, but to go into a herd of pigs. He allows them to go, and then they drown 2,000 pigs. And I want to share, I want to share some insights that I've learned. I got to hear some interesting insights about the scripture this week. But, but specifically this part of the story. First of all, we need to first acknowledge how crazy it is that this guy had been living with enough demons to kill 2,000 pigs like that. Okay, let that sink in. Jesus sends these demons out. It takes a herd of thousands of pigs and throws them and drowns them in water. And this guy had been living like this for years. The fact that this guy had all that going on inside of him and survived is a miracle. And that's like some of us in here with our stories. The fact that you guys have gone through life, that I have gone through parts of life, the way we have, the things that we've dealt with, and that we've survived, is a miracle in some cases. But there's still this question, okay, why, why did the demons ask to go into the pigs? Now, have you ever wondered that, for those of you that have read this story before? It's kind of just an odd thing. Because again, other times, Jesus just kind of casts the demon out and it just goes away. But this time the demon decides the demons decide that they want to have bacon too. Um, well, the truth is these people lived in an agrarian society where your animals are your wealth. Your worth was only as much as the animals you owned. And 2,000 pigs is a lot of animals and a lot of money. And in one instant, Satan used these demons to drown the economy of what might have been for the entire town. And if you look at the response of the people in this, you can see how big of a deal it is. It says the people that are watching the pigs, the people that watch this happen, you can imagine if you were one of the shepherds of these pigs, <laughs> like, like, oh, I'm so fired. Okay? But said so they freak out about this and they run into the towns and countryside. They're grabbing people and they're like, dude, you guys gotta see this. This is crazy. And they get to Jesus and they look at the crazy man, the naked, chained up, bloody guy, and it says he's dressed and in his right mind, and that naturally gets their attention. Right? Like, oh, what is going on here right now? And then they hear about the pigs. And I'm pretty sure it was a crazy sight. Like, I want you just to kind of like picture this in your mind's eye, what 2,000 drowned pigs would have looked like. What it would have smelled like. And the response to this wasn't to rejoice that their crazy Halloween horror guy that's stalking the graveyards crying out day and night is better. It's not to go, wow, Jesus, you're incredible. Look at what you did. Nobody can even help this guy. And look at him now. It was to send Jesus away. They didn't understand the significance of what had just happened. And all they could see was what they lost. And it scared them. They sent Jesus away because they were afraid of maybe what else it might cost them. If Jesus stayed, what else do I stand to lose? And there's something we have to understand about this spiritual battle that we're in. Satan knows how to attack what is most valuable to us. Because his goal is to keep us as far away from Jesus as possible. He doesn't want you getting anywhere near a Bible, anywhere near the doors of the church, anywhere near making a phone call to somebody that might have a semblance of Jesus in him. And to that length, he'll come after all the things in life that we hold most dear so that maybe we'll be tempted to blame God. God, why would you let this happen? 
Do you know how much those pigs cost me, God? Do you know what this is going to do to my year? Maybe to resent God. Maybe to be afraid of God. Or just to run as far away from Jesus as possible. That was me this week. This week, always ironically, whenever I'm getting ready to preach a sermon, God allows me to go through some things that I get to vulnerably share to everybody. But this week, Satan came after me. He came after me with our finances. I was feeling like, man, you know, the first of the month was this week. And we had an expense rollover that was getting me freaked out. And now, now all of a sudden, I'm not thanking God for my life anymore. I'm questioning why would God let this happen? He attacked me in my marriage. My wife and I were struggling to get along this week. It was mostly my fault, as is usually the case. <laughs> but Satan came after things that are incredibly important to me. He wants to come after your money. He wants your car to break down, your AC to stop working, you to get let go from your job. And now your heart and mind, it's completely wrapped up in your finances and not your faith. He'll come after your health. There's nothing that can take you down quicker than when you get the flu. Now all of a sudden there is no God. You just want to die in bed. <laughs> That's me. I'm a big wuss when I get sick. He'll come after your friends at school. Feeling like I need to impress these people that I may not see when high school is over. Feeling like, man, I got these people that I want to like me so bad that I feel like I want to, I want to change who I am to, to be approved. He'll come after the guy or come after you with the guy or girl that you're interested in that may or may not like you back. He'll come after you in your marriage. He'll come after your kids. He'll come after your future. He'll come after an addiction or a pet sin that you can't seem to shake. He will send a legion of demons to attack these things. Because he knows something. He knows something that Jesus knows too. He knows what can happen if you really get to Jesus and come out of the tombs. Satan knows what you're capable of once you turn into Jesus. And he'll stop at nothing to try to keep you from him. Let's finish the story. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how much he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell him the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. Once the dust had settled, this man wanted to come with Jesus, but Jesus had other plans for him. So he sent him away, where eventually he went to a place called the Decapolis. And the Decapolis was actually a cluster of ten cities. It's a Deca, ten. Um, and it says that he just basically he just went around telling everyone what Jesus had done for him. Later on, actually, you can see later in Mark, but we're going to look at the Matthew account, Jesus ends up going to the Decapolis. Don't know exactly how long it was. Maybe it was a year later, a couple months later. But sometime after this guy had been released into the, into the Decapolis, Jesus shows up. And in Matthew 15, verse 19, it says, Jesus left there and went along the Sea of Galilee. Great crowds came to him bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others, and laid them at his feet, and he healed them. The people were amazed, and they praised the God of Israel. You know, I've looked at several commentaries about, uh, about this story in, in specific, 
And a lot of these commentators suggest that the reason why there were great crowds that met Jesus when he landed in the Decapolis was because of this guy. This one man getting unchained and unbroken, freed from his demons, went into these ten cities, and he made sure everybody knew what Jesus had done. One man's story could have changed the lives of people in ten different cities. Why? Because he had had a real encounter with Jesus. And that encounter changed his life. Satan knows the power of a story that's come in contact with Jesus. After the months that we've been doing this series, I do think it's time that we ask ourselves if we're really ready to have our story changed. It doesn't matter if this is your first time to church or you've been coming your whole life. Are you going to continue to live like this guy? Enslaved, hopeless, walking through the graveyard of life just hoping it gets better? Or will you be like him in the way that he ran to Jesus, fell on his knees, and turned himself in? We're going to take communion here in just a moment together. And I want to read one more passage together in Romans chapter 5. And it reads, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies... We were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Paul's reminding us here that, that Jesus died while we were enemies, it says, to help us to be reconciled. And the word reconciliation is a powerful one. So imagine even somebody like this, like this man that just was beyond help, beyond saving. And it says that he's dressed in his right mind. To be reconciled is like the idea of taking an enemy and making him your brother. And so that Jesus died while you and I are enemies. At our worst. When we are unkempt. Beyond anybody else's help. Beyond saving. No chains can hold us back. It was at that moment that Jesus said, yeah, I'm dying for them. And it's not something we've earned or something we get through osmosis just by sitting in church. You have to be ready to turn in and make Jesus Lord of your life. The cool thing about this story to me is you got this guy that was, that was just, uh, and Jesus encounters this man, frees him from what was going on in his life, and then unleashed him to the world. And when this man experienced Jesus, when he got free, when he, when he got into the world to tell people what, what Jesus did, it changed things for everybody around him. Jesus is waiting to unleash you to the world. Satan knows how dangerous you are with Jesus. But the question for us is, are we going to turn in? The reconciliation has been bought, it's been paid for. But we have to accept it. We have to be willing to lay down our lives to make Jesus Lord. 
And if you're here with us in church, maybe for the first time or you've been coming for a couple times, I want to urge you, don't take this lightly. You might be feeling like this guy that just, man, you've been stuck in life and you've got no hope. Like I said, Jesus specializes in lost causes. Many of us, if not all of us here, are a lost cause. But we've got to run to Jesus. I want to urge you, please, talk to somebody that invited you out. Study the Bible. Get to know who Jesus really is. Really get to experience an encounter like this that changes you. And if you've been a disciple for a while and you've been stuck, repent. Stop going back to your chains. Stop going back to the tombs in the graveyard. Get cleaned and get turned in. We're going to bow our heads for a word of prayer and then we're going to take our communion together. Father, I just really want to thank you so much. I know you didn't die because we deserved it, but you died because we didn't deserve it. And that, Father, it's, it's easy to look at this guy and kind of imagine what his life, what his story really looked like, but, but I know that even that is beyond us. But the truth is that this is all of our story. We are all beyond saving. We are all beyond our own help or the help of other people around us. God, we're, we're only being able to made, be made clean, be made right, and be, be set free because of you and because of Jesus. I pray that right now you really will, will lead us to the cross at this moment. Help us to, to, to really connect with, you know, as we drink the juice, that we think about the blood that was spilled. God, as we were cutting ourselves with stones, crying out for help, God, that Jesus was dying on the cross, shedding his blood and allowing his body to be broken so that we could experience reconciliation with you. But I pray also that that won't be just the end of our story. God, that you will use us in the world to save others as well. God, help us to be a light in a world full of darkness. God, we love you so much. We thank you and it's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.